Hey everybody, Ranger Andrew here. So, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you guys, um, but rather than uh, a normal Coffee with a Ranger episode where I come to you guys to talk about something that I've learned recently that is interesting or funny, uh, I wanted to talk to you about something that I think is important. Um, and so I apologize for that in advance if that's not what you're here for. Um, and also this is going to be a little... Uh, less scripted than normal uh, for that reason. So if this looks a little rough or I lose my train of thought, I apologize for that as well. But the thing I want to talk about today is Martin Van Buren, which, you know, crazy to hear that from us, right? Um, it's an odd choice of topic for us. But uh, specifically, I wanted to talk about Martin Van Buren and something that I often try to interrogate with visitors who come to our site on our programming. And that is Van Buren's role as a political compromiser. Um, Van Buren is one of many. He's not unique in the fact that his political career focused on compromises. Uh, Henry Clay, one of Van Buren's uh, contemporaries, is probably the most famous political compromiser of his time. One of his nicknames was the Great Compromiser. But Van Buren was very similar. And because of this, his political role, or his political legacy really, is trying to broker these deals, set up these alliances, create these systems to bring people together. And really, his focus throughout his political career was trying to tie the country together at a time that it was trying to rip itself apart. And most of the time, we tend to think of that or talk about that as universally a good thing. And I'm not trying to say that it's universally bad. Um, I think there are very few people who would say that, you know, striving to provide unity is a bad thing. But the thing about compromise is that it inherently benefits the status quo. And what I mean by that is all these compromises that happened during the antebellum period, I think there's probably few things that define the antebellum period more than compromises, is that all of them inherently benefit the slaveholding class because nothing could happen without their approval. Um, certainly not everything went their way, but there was enough uh, slaveholding politicians, or people who were politicians that were backed by slaveholders, or northern politicians who were willing to work with slaveholders like Van Buren, that every compromise that had to happen in some way benefited them. And that is the cost of these compromises, and it's something that's often overlooked. Um, we often talk about during our tours or in our programs about how, well, this act, this compromise, whether we're talking about the Compromise of 1850 or the Missouri Compromise in 1820 or so on, that they delay the Civil War. And we, of course, don't know what would have happened if any of these compromises had gone the other way, but it at least appears to be true in many cases. But what does that mean is the question that I often try to prompt, because Van Buren is toting compromise up until the days before the Civil War breaks out, saying that civil war can be avoided if we just do this, that, and the other thing. And on the other hand, you have people like Frederick Douglass, you know, one of the most famous runaway slaves in, or self-emancipating slaves in American history, who is terrified of compromise on the dawn of the Civil War. And the reason he is terrified of that compromise is because it leaves behind these three million people who were enslaved in the South at that time. Now, uh, Douglas will eventually go extremely hard line on this point and say that he wants the war to be as bloody and terrible as possible because he thinks that's the only way for slavery to end. And now, on the other hand, of course, war is terrible, and terrible things happened to hundreds of thousands of people because of the Civil War. But to Douglas, the alternative was the enslavement of three million people, and he knew what was enslavement was like. So he could not walk away from the problem via compromise. And Van Buren could. So 
I want to talk about an example of this. Because Van Buren is in an interesting prolet place in terms of people talking about him, historians like us at the Van Buren site, or people who write books about him, etc. In that most people don't. Uh, most people don't write books about Martin Van Buren. He is not a great subject of a lot of uh, historians. And sometimes, because he is subject of so little history, um, people talk about him in ways that I don't think are entirely correct. Uh, for example, some historians cast Van Buren as an abolitionist uh, because at the end of his career, he or at the end of his actual political career, where he's running himself, he will join and run as the presidential candidate of the Free Soil Party, which argues against the extension of slavery um, to into the territories out west that were just won in the Mexican-American War. And so people say that Van Buren, even though he compromised with the South and worked with the South for most of his career, made this great stand. And because of that, he's an abolitionist. That's not true. Uh, Van Buren never identifies himself as an abolitionist at any point. And honestly, it is hard to say what his opinions on slavery actually were. His family will own slaves when he's a child. He will willingly work with the South uh, and slaveholders for the vast majority of his political career. He will ardently deny being an abolitionist for most of his political career. But then he does make this free soil run. So de depending on how you want to look at it, you could either say that he was totally for slavery his entire career and then just made this stand at the end of his career because it was politically convenient, or you could go the exact opposite direction and say that he was against slavery his entire life and that he only he made this stand at the end of his life because it was then no longer politically inconvenient to move against slavery. You could make an argument for either of those, and both of them could have equal support. We have no idea what his opinions actually were. But Van Buren was a compromiser, and even this move at the end of his actual political career, he goes back on, because at the very end of his life, in 1857, the Dred Scott case is decided by the Supreme Court, uh, and it is the case that decides that, uh, so Dred Scott, for the background, is a enslaved man who is brought to a free territory by his owner, and then uh, afterwards sues for his freedom based on the fact that he was in a free state at one point. He loses. The Supreme Court decides, led by uh, Roger Tawney, that they uh, are still enslaved, uh, and he, uh, well, first they rule that he doesn't even have the right to sue because he is not a citizen, and, and furthermore, that African people cannot be citizens the way that white people can, and that he is still enslaved, and that, furthermore, the entire Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional and that slavery can exist anywhere. I'm minimizing and summarizing a little bit, but that's the gist of it. And this is explosive. The entire country goes up uh, in one way or another. In the South, this is treated as a massive victory. In the North, people are aghast at this. this uh, some people interpret this that slavery could exist all the way up here in New York again, or in Massachusetts, uh, and all of it would be equally constitutionally valid because of this Supreme Court decision. And Van Buren agrees with this. Van Buren, after arguing and running on the platform of ending the extension of slavery in 1848, uh, almost 10 years later, says, yeah, you know, I think Tawny's right. And I'm going to read you a quote here, so excuse, excuse me reading this, but I think it is, it is worth reading. So Van Buren, in his book on the inquiry into the origin and courses of political parties, says, I am now convinced that the sense in which the word citizen was used by those who framed and ratified the federal constitution was not intended to embrace the African race. So Van Buren basically saying that in, uh, African people cannot be citizens of this country, and he agrees to the Supreme Court decision. And Van Buren never seems to go back on this opinion. It, it, admittedly, at this point in his life, there's not a whole lot that we have to go on. But if he ever reneged on this opinion, uh, I've never seen a document that says it. So it seems as though Van Buren goes to his grave uh, believing that African Americans are, should not be allowed to be, or excuse me, were not meant to be citizens under the original Constitution. And 
Dred Scott does not last that long because under the Civil War amendments, it is almost entirely taken apart because all of its decisions about slavery are irrelevant in the face of these post-war amendments, or excuse me, during the war amendments, really, um, saying that slavery doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but the this idea, this opinion that Van Buren espouses doesn't go away. It doesn't take that long in the Reconstruction South for people who believe, like Van Buren does, that African Americans shouldn't be citizens to reassert control of their states. And although there is a brief and glorious moment where there are a few African Americans elected to Congress and one to the Senate, that doesn't last long as these people reassert control. So, I, I guess my point is that Van Buren had privilege. He had the privilege to walk away from the conversation of the rights of African Americans and about slavery because it didn't affect him directly. Um, it was a tool in his political toolbox is all it really seems. Um, that's perhaps why he goes back and forth on it on so many points during the course of his career. But people like Douglas, who I mentioned before, did not have that luxury. It affected them directly, uh, some more than others, certainly. But regardless of whether you were enslaved in the South or free in the North as a person of African descent, Dred Scott mattered to you. And... The Civil War mattered to you. Um, and again, that meant many different things to many different people. But to Van Buren, all of that paled in the face of him trying to hold the country together. But that had a cost. It was just often not a cost that he had to bear. Now, if you've made it this far in the video, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, before we go, I'd like to leave you with a question, if I'm allowed. Um, and that question is, what do you have the privilege to walk away from? Because I think we all do. And I think thinking about these things in the past is often much easier than thinking about them in the present. But thinking about them in the past often spurs me to think about them in the present. And I think like Van Buren, we all have the privilege to walk away from things. And I'd ask you what you think those things are. But with that, uh, take care, stay safe out there, and I will see you all next time.